You are responsible. By Venerable Dr. K. Sri Damananda. You may wish to think that your sorrows and miseries are caused by a family curse handed down from one generation to another. Or perhaps they arise because of some sins committed by a distant ancestor who has now returned from the grave to torment you. Or maybe your sorrows are created by God, or the devil. Yet, have you considered for a moment that the cause may really lie with, yourself? Yes, yourself. You have caused your own failure, hardship and unhappiness. But is it not convenient, human nature you might say, to place the blame on others? Rather than seeing yourself as being responsible for them? Often when a man is forced to see his own weakness, he avoids it and instead gives in to self-deceit. He will search his brain for an excuse, even the lamest one will do, to justify his actions. He may succeed in doing this. Sometimes he succeeds so well in trying to fool others, that he even manages to fool himself with the very ghost created by his mind. A person may fool some of the people some of the time, but not all the people all of the time. The fool according to the Buddha, who does not admit he is a fool is a real fool. And the fool who admits he is a fool is wise to that extent. If you have made a mistake, then admit it. You need courage, of course to admit that you have fallen victim to it and make that admission no matter how unpleasant that may be. You also need wisdom to see your own faults. The Buddha did say, easily seen are others' faults, hard indeed to see one's own faults. You should not evade self-responsibility for your own actions by blaming them on circumstances. During times of difficulties and trying moments, work on cheerfully instead of showing a sour face. Be courageous to change if change is necessary. Be serene enough to accept what you cannot change, and be wise to know the difference. Do not think that you have been unlucky, or is an unfortunate victim of fate. Face your shortcomings. You must realize that your mind has created the conditions which give rise to the miseries and difficulties you are experiencing. It is only after you have truly realized this fact and do not succumb to self-deceit that you can begin to create conditions necessary for your happiness. Cause of your troubles According to the Buddha, man makes his own destiny. He should not blame anyone for his troubles since he alone is responsible for his own life, for better or for worse. Man creates everything, all his griefs and misfortunes as well as his happiness and success. Others may exert an influence over his life, yet it is he who actually creates his own karma, through his intentional reactions. He must therefore be responsible for the effects. Seen in this light, there is no human being or deva who can direct or control a person's attainment of ultimate salvation, or downfall. Acting with pure heart and mind, all his words and actions become pure. However, acting with polluted heart and mind, he continues to create evil actions which will shape his character and destiny. You may be a person who is good and harmless by nature, yet you are blamed by others. You have your share of difficulties and disappointments even if you have assisted others without a thought for yourself. You might then ask, if good begets good, bad begets bad, why should I have to suffer when I'm completely innocent? Why should I have to undergo so many difficulties and disappointments? Why should I be blamed despite my good work? The answer is a simple one, you do not know you are now facing a past bad karma that is ripening. Continue with your good work, and soon you will be free from such troubles. You have created your own disappointments and you alone can overcome them by realizing the nature of your own action karma as taught by the Buddha. Your troubles and difficulties are really self-caused. They arise from actions rooted in greed, hatred, and delusion. In fact, suffering is the price you pay for craving for existence and sensual pleasures. The price which comes as physical pain and mental agony is a heavy one to pay. It is like paying rental or taxes for the house you occupy. The rental is the physical pain and mental agony you undergo, while the house is your physical body through which you experience the worldly pleasures of the senses. You have to pay the price for the enjoyment, nothing is really free of charge, unfortunately. So long as you are caught in the iron pincers of craving, you experience pain and agony. However, if you wish to reduce or eliminate that pain, you will have to subdue, and even renounce, 
your strong craving for sensual pleasure. You are confronted with a choice, to enjoy sensual pleasure you must be prepared to experience suffering, or to renounce craving so as to delight in spiritual happiness. There are no two ways about it. Who is responsible? There is an old saying which goes, the uncultured man always blames others. The semi-cultured man blames himself, and the fully cultured man blames neither. You must learn to face and handle your problems like the fully cultured man in that quotation. Do not try to find a convenient scapegoat on which to place your blame, as many are inclined to do. Many people find scapegoats in a person or group of people so easily that they are unable to see their own mistakes staring at them. All right, you may say, I will not blame anyone. I have only myself to blame. No, you must not even blame yourself. Finger pointing at others or yourself is negative and will not bring you any nearer to the solution of your problems. Put aside fault finding. Instead have courage and understanding. The cultivation of a positive frame of mind will help to solve many of your problems, and also make the world a much better place to live in for everyone. If you can avoid blaming, both yourself and others, then you may begin to realize that you are at one with the world. You are part and parcel of all things and inseparable from the world. Therefore, the world is good if you are good, and bad if you are bad. You will not try to escape from your problems by blaming the world, by saying that the world is wrong while you are right. When you begin to see things as they are and not as they appear to be, you will understand that there is really no one to be blamed. And yet, in the highest sense, it takes wisdom to realize that you are responsible for everything. Ways to Reduce Your Troubles From this section onwards you may find some useful advice on how to overcome your difficulties, and find harmony, peace and happiness with yourself and others. 1. Facing Your Problems Whenever certain difficulties and problems arise, a person should try to understand them in the context of the nature of existence. He cannot expect things to be perfect, conditions congenial and all his plans to run smoothly all the time. Yet, these are the very things he craves for. The truth is that the more desire he has for things to remain unchanging, congenial and perfect, the greater will be his disappointment when the reverse occurs. Like the waxing and waning of the moon, all things change, not always in the desired direction. This fluxing state of fortunes, circumstances and states of mind represents the worldly conditions star. The Buddha spoke about the eight worldly conditions which afflict all worldlings, gain and loss, honor and dishonor, praise and blame, happiness and sorrow. The nature of the world is such that one cannot expect to experience good conditions all the time. When conditions are unfavorable, you may feel during such times that you have come to the road end, and the whole world is against you. But before allowing everything around you to collapse, just compare the degree of pain you suffer with that experienced by others more unfortunate than yourself. If you are frustrated at losing your wallet to a pickpocket, think of the suffering endured by people who have lost their homes and entire life savings in a fire or flood. If you feel depressed at not being born with a pretty face, think of the many others who are born blind, dumb, deformed, crippled and mentally retarded. Compared to the troubles of others, your troubles become insignificant. In other words, if you are to change your attitude so as to count your blessings instead of troubles, you will find yourself better off than many others. As an old Chinese saying has it, if you have a big problem, reduce it to a small problem. If you have a small problem, reduce it to no problem. You will be surprised how many of your worries disappear when problems are seen in their proper perspective. You may wish to recall your previous experiences on how you were able to overcome the difficulties at first thought to be insurmountable. By so doing, you will not be overwhelmed by the problems, and you will be able to solve those problems with your mental and physical resources. Just think that the problem you are facing is not the worst that can ever happen, and that you have been through bigger problems before. Then face your problem squarely and use your mental prowess to get over, under, around or through the problem. Many of your problems evaporate into thin air if you have such resolution. Even if the problem turns out to be worse than you expected. 
when you emerge out of it your self-confidence will grow with the knowledge that you are really stronger than you thought you were. Everyone faces problems, though each will react and adjust to them differently. Given a similar set of troubles, some treat them lightly, appearing hale and hearty. Some look forward to problems, considering them as challenges which can motivate them to use fully their mental and physical energies. On the other hand, some break down or are overwhelmed and be made completely incapacitated by the troubles. Problems there always are. The crux of the matter is not so much as how to escape from all troubles but how you would handle them without creating other problems. 2. Responsibility for inner peace The calm and peace within a person's mind can either be prolonged or dissipated depending on his mental attitude. His inner peace can be maintained with self-surrender and the casting away of pride. If he were to cling to the false ego and maintain a negative attitude, trouble and an unsettled mind soon result. In his effort to promote his selfish goals and narrow interest, he makes himself unbearable to others and brings harm to himself. On the other hand, regardless of external conditions, a person can have happiness through maintaining a balanced mind and a positive attitude. And that happy state is lost only because he allows external conditions to upset it. For instance, let us assume that a criticism has just been made about you or your work. Very often, in such a situation you may feel insulted. Your ego may be damaged. But before you let such thought arise, examine that criticism objectively. On the one hand, if the criticism given is well founded and arises with good intention, you should accept that criticism in good faith so as to use it constructively for self improvement. On the other hand, if it is unjust, ill founded, and given with bad intention, there is still no person to lose your temper and to retaliate, just ignore the criticism since it is untrue and you are under no obligation to accept it. Such should be your attitude towards all criticisms constructive or negative. If you have acted with sincere motives and your actions are commended by the wise, then you should not be deterred from performing good works because of an unkind tongue. Take comfort by following the Dhamma, truth, which will be your protection. The Buddha said, whoever harms a harmless person, one pure and guiltless, upon that very fool evil recoils like fine dust thrown against the wind and you will not feel hurt unless you allow others to succeed in doing it. In addition, the mental attitude you have towards others can determine the attitude you receive in return. If you show love and kindness to others, you will receive that love and kindness reflected back to you. But if you show hatred, then hatred will be your only reward. Do not expect to receive love in return for hatred, charity for selfishness, and sympathy for thoughtlessness. You are responsible for creating and promoting good relationships with others so that peace rather than trouble will prevail. 3. Superiority, Equality and Inferiority You can avoid having unnecessary worry and trouble if you refrain from comparing yourself with others. By itself the act of comparison may not be wrong if it inspires you to become wiser in thought and nobler in deeds. But, too often, Comparing yourself with others to see who is superior leads to conceit and unnecessary worry. If you think you are equal to others, you may become complacent and stagnate. If you think you are inferior to others, you may become timid and helpless. Therefore to avoid having such negative mental states, refrain from making comparisons. It may be useful to remember that superiority, equality and inferiority are relative states which change constantly with time place and circumstances. In the endless rounds within the ocean of life and death, samsara, we have all been superior, equal and inferior to one another at different times. At one time you may be a beggar, while at another a millionaire. For expect nothing and you cannot be disappointed. Everyone has hopes that his wishes will be fulfilled someday. It is hope that gently persuades a person to strive onwards unrelentingly in the face of difficulties and failure in order that he may reach to greater heights. This expectation of the fulfillment of his dreams in some distant future keeps him bright with optimism. However, when a person goes beyond mere hoping and begins to expect things to happen according to his wishes, he is in for disappointments. He does good only because he expects some reward or reciprocal action. And if that reward is not forthcoming, he becomes disillusioned with performing good works. If you do good, 
then do it for the sake of doing service to some fellow being. The happiness which arises in your mind together with the performance of the deed is itself a big reward. To be happy, you should transcend the desire of getting gratitude from others for each deed performed. In any society, gratitude is a rare virtue. This is the reason why you should remember the kindness and assistance others have given you. The Buddha considered gratitude to be a great blessing, a positive quality to develop. But if you have rendered help to others, try not to expect gratitude in order to avoid disappointments. If you do, then you are placing your happiness at the mercy of others who are inclined to be forgetful. If they fail to show gratitude, learn to accept such forgetfulness in good spirit. If they do remember your kindness, then treat it as a bonus in addition to the opportunity you have of serving others. If you do this, then you can be happy regardless of whether your deeds are remembered or not. 5. Tolerance, Patience and Understanding Occasionally people who have led good and peaceful lives complain that they have become victims of the wiles and intrigues of others. They have not caused trouble to others, yet they are harmed through no fault of their own. Under such circumstances, the innocent victims must realize and understand that the world is composed of a wide variety of people with their idiosyncrasies, the good and the not so good, the bad and the not so bad. Therefore, he may console himself that he belongs to the good category, whereas the disturber of peace belongs to the bad category. And on certain occasions, he has to put up with the misdeeds of the bad ones. It is like the case of the good and careful driver and the bad and reckless driver. The good and careful driver takes every precaution to drive carefully so as to avoid accidents. Nevertheless, he sometimes meets with accidents through no fault of his, but that of the bad and reckless driver. Thus, the good sometimes have to suffer because there are bad people just as there are bad drivers. After saying all that, it is useful to remember that the really good drivers can avoid getting into accidents because they act wisely on the road and anticipate the actions of other drivers correctly. This is no different from averting potential problems with troublemakers and evildoers. One obvious way is to avoid associating with them as far as possible, especially when you are not in a position to change their ways. You may not have the strength to resist from being drawn into the whirlpool of hatred and vengeance. But if you are strong enough to resist their evil influences, then you should make every effort to correct them instead of isolating and neglecting them. They are human beings too who can be brought into the religious fold. The way to influence evildoers to be good is through the wise practice of tolerance, patience and understanding. Understanding will be your shield to protect yourself from their wiles, and compassion will be your flame to melt all hearts. A man often does wrong because of his ignorance or misunderstanding about himself. His desire of gaining happiness, and the way to obtain happiness. If this is so, then it is during the time when he errs that you should act consistently with your education and religious training. It is during such times of trial that the strength of your character, wisdom and compassion may be known. When others do you wrong, they offer you an opportunity to be aware of your defilements and virtues so that with such understanding you will be able to work towards the removal of the defilements and the strengthening of your virtues. Tolerance, patience and understanding these are great qualities for you to practice during times when a man acts out of ignorance. These qualities can help to relieve you from the miseries, suffering and burden of life. Some people may take advantage of your goodness when you practice these qualities. But you should not feel threatened if you act wisely. Because these qualities have the ability to make the wrongdoers realize their error and the power to transform them into doing good. 6. Forgive and forget. Taking revenge on your troublemakers create more problems and difficulties for everyone. In contemplating vengeance, you spark off the fire of hatred within your heart and feed it the fuel of delusion to let it grow. This fire will grow so big that it can consume everything in its path, yourself first before anyone else. Hatred is like a poison which you inject into your veins, before injecting it into your enemy. It is like throwing cow dung at another, you dirty your hands first, before you dirty others. When a person submits to hatred, he becomes no different from the evildoer, the object of his anger. By giving in to hatred, he surrenders his self-control without coming any closer to the solution of his problem. 
he becomes the loser. When an angry person tries to instigate another but receives an unconcerned smile instead, he is usually overcome by a feeling of despair. He feels frustrated for not being able to upset the other person and make him angry. He is defeated because the other party has not cooperated by way of losing his head and joining in the mudslinging. The Buddha said, Ah, happily do we live without hate amongst the hateful. Amidst the hateful, we live without hate. You act wisely like a cultured man by not hating or hitting back at your troublemaker. You must understand that at that moment, the troublemaker may have been intoxicated with greed, anger, jealousy, and ignorance. He is no different from other human beings who have similarly been intoxicated at other times. Such an understanding would come to you through the practice of mindfulness. When a person practices mindfulness, he has an intimate understanding of his motivations and desires, his weakness and strength. That self-awareness helps him to remove the unwholesome thoughts and increase the good ones. When he understands himself better, he realizes that other beings are caught in a similar predicament. He sees his fellow beings trapped in the net of self-illusion, blinded by ignorance, struggling vainly to satisfy their every desire. From that ignorance and desire, arise the performance of deeds which brings unhappiness to others and themselves. Yet, in spite of these limitations and weakness, these beings have every potential to experience spiritual growth. Realizing this, such a person develops compassion for all beings, tolerates the problems they create, and learns to forgive and forget. The Buddha taught, evildoers are not wicked by nature. Many people do evil because of their ignorance. Since they are ignorant, we should not curse or condemn them forever. We should instead try to correct them and explain to them their error. Such compassion and understanding taught by the Buddha helps one to treat an evildoer just as one would a patient suffering from a sickness. Instead of condemning him for being sick, you should try to remove the cause of his sickness so that he may become well and happy. By radiating compassion and loving kindness to a person, you give him a chance to realize his folly and give up his bad habit. Compassion and loving kindness have the power to change a troublemaker into a bane factor, and your enemies into friends. The Buddha once said, Hatreds do not cease by hatred. By love alone do they cease. This is an eternal law. If a person keeps on doing wrong to you, on your part you should correct Hiri each time. Try to follow the noble example set by the Buddha who always returned good for evil. The Buddha said, The more evil that comes to me, the more good will radiate from me. Some people think that it is not practical to return good for evil. By returning evil for evil they aggravate the danger of the situation. As for yourself, try to return good for evil. When we say return good for evil we do not necessarily mean this in a physical sense. Rather, it is more important to develop a mental state where a loving kindness is felt towards all beings that inhabit the world. Develop thoughts of goodwill so that you will constantly think well of others, no matter how much they hurt or harm you. Even if you find that at this moment this is something which is difficult to perform. You still do a great service to yourself and others by not returning evil for evil. Asterisk read more about these conditions in the Facts of Life by Narada Thera. Gems of Buddhist Wisdom Ancient Wisdom and Modern Problems, 16 Francis Story the history of man's conquest of his environment has been from the earliest times a story of adaptation to changes wrought by his own increasing mastery of the technique of living. It has been, at best, but a partial conquest. Differences in mode of living have not necessarily been accompanied by the changes in mode of thought or outlook that might be expected. Man remains, below the surface, a primitive animal. His instincts work themselves out in the pattern of a more complex civilization and their responses are to situations apparently far removed from those that confronted his forebears. Yet the instincts themselves are not different. They remain basically unchanged since the time of the earliest records left to us. Events and situations arise from character, and while the instincts that bring them about remain unchanged, the situations and problems themselves must be fundamentally the same though they appear in different garb. The facile post-Darwinian optimism which 
through a misinterpretation of the theory of evolution, believed that mankind was steadily improving. Has been discarded. Knowledge, however far it may advance, cannot liberate the spirit of man. Though it may free him from some intellectual bonds, only to replace them by others. Egoism, craving, the will to live are dominant factors, to which mere knowledge, without the saving grace of wisdom, must remain subservient. A cursory glance at the earliest Therav plus or minus de Buddhist texts is sufficient to show that the problems of today had their counterparts in the India of 2,500 years ago. The life in plus and will to live in all beings springs from craving, and the Buddha, at the time of his enlightenment, declared, Vainly have I wandered for many births. Seeking the builder of this house, painful was repeated birth. Now O builder of the house, you are found, you shall build no house again. The house is the corporeal form, the builder is craving, the tenacious instinct to cling to life. To experience conscious existence as a being among other beings. That is why the problems that confront humanity now are fundamentally the same as those that have vexed it from the dawn of history. They are merely transposed into a different key, given a global instead of a limited personal or tribal implication. In the life of today, religion, once a major factor in world history, plays a relatively unimportant part. The attitude of the modern man, his mind attuned to other and apparently more immediate and practical affairs, is conditioned by religion only to the extent to which early training, impressed on a pliant consciousness, remains with him to color his mental landscape. Among large sections of the world's peoples, formal religion has ceased to have any active influence. Actions are weighed and judged, not by religious or moral standards, but by their success or failure from the purely mundane point of view. They have ceased to be right or wrong and have become simply practical or impractical. An opportunist ethos has been established in place of the former mystique as a governing principle in human behavior. As the result of a decline in the belief in an afterlife with its concomitant of retributive justice. In one sense this may be accepted as a step in the direction of rationalism. But since the motivating factor behind opportunist action remains still the old instinct of savage man. The part played by reason is only a subsidiary one. Reason is employed in the service of motives that are essentially unreasonable. In a famous discourse, the Brahmaj plus or minus La Sutta of the D superscript 2 Ganik plus or minus Ye, the Buddha enumerates 62 types of religio-philosophical systems current in his day. Ranging from transcendental idealism to gross materialism, rejecting all of them. The Indian speculative mind was capable of metaphysical subtleties that have not been known in Europe since the days of the medieval Skolman. And many of these ancient Brahmanic theories have disappeared from the world, leaving only their names. But the more pronounced and antagonistic of the doctrines are to be found with us still. Some of them masquerading as the latest developments of human thought. In another discourse, the APA degree degree aka Sutta of the Mahihima Nik plus or minus Ye, the Buddha deals with one such ism in the following words. There are some ascetics and Brahmins who hold and maintain that there is nothing given, sacrificed, or offered. There is no wisdom ripening of the fruit of good or bad actions, there is neither this world nor another world. There is neither mother nor father, nor apparitional beings, there are in the world no ascetics nor Brahmins who have gone and followed the right way. And who of themselves have realized the world with higher knowledge and proclaim it. In this case, householders, it is to be expected that those ascetics and Brahmins who hold and maintain that there is no ripening of the fruit of good or bad actions and that there is no other world, will abandon the three good things. Good behavior indeed, word and thought, and will embrace and practice the three bad things. Evil behavior indeed, word and thought. And why is that? Because they do not see the danger and folly and depravity of bad things nor the blessing of renunciation and the purity of good things. Though there is indeed another world, their view is that there is not, and that is a false view. Though there is indeed another world, they decide that there is not, and that is their false resolve. Though there is indeed another world, they assert that there is not, and that is false speech. Though there is indeed another world, they say that there is not, 
and act directly contrary to those Arahas who have a knowledge of the other worlds. Though there is indeed another world, they instruct others that there is not, and this is instruction of false doctrine. With this instruction of false doctrine they exalt themselves and disparage others. Thus their former virtue is destroyed and immorality is produced, and there results this false view, false resolve, false speech. This instruction of false doctrine opposed to the noble ones, this exaltation of themselves and disparaging of others. Even so these many bad things arise on account of their false view. In this case, householders, an intelligent man reflects thus. If there is no other world, then this individual with the dissolution of the body will attain safety, by annihilation. But if there is another world, this individual with the dissolution of the body after death will be reborn in an unhappy state of punishment. In hell. If you like, suppose there is no other world or suppose the words of these ascetics and Brahmins to be true. Yet this individual gets blamed by the intelligent even in this life for holding false views and for being a nihilist. But if there really is another world, this individual has the unlucky cast in both cases. As he gets blamed even in this life by the intelligent for holding false views. And with the dissolution of the body after death he will be reborn in an unhappy state. In a place of punishment, in hell. Thus this particular doctrine is badly taken and embraced. He persists in being one-sided, and he gives up a sound position. In this case it is to be expected that those ascetics and Brahmins who hold and maintain that there is ripening of good and bad actions, that there is another world, will abandon the three bad things, evil behavior in deed, word and thought, and will embrace and practice the three good things, good behavior in deed, word and thought. And why is this? Because they see the danger and folly and depravity of bad things. And the blessing of renunciation and purity of good things. Thus their former vice is destroyed and virtue is produced, and there results this right view. Right resolve, right speech, this instruction in the true doctrine not opposed to the noble ones. Their avoidance of exalting themselves and disparaging others. Even so these many good things arise on account of their right view. Preaching on the doctrine of Kama, the scientific law of action and reaction. To a Brahman student, Subha, the Buddha touches on a problem greatly highlighted in present-day thought. That of human inequality. This manifestation that inequalities among beings must always be a feature of human life. And it is thus that Buddhism explains the seeming injustices to which people are subject from birth. The doctrine of Kama presents life and the universe in the light of logical and impartial law. A law, moreover, which is strictly in accordance with scientific principles of cause and effect. When the Buddha was asked concerning the welfare of nations and communities, with special reference to the Vajans, a clan threatened by its neighbors, he said, So long, Ananda, as the Vajans shall assemble repeatedly and in large numbers, for unity. Just so long may the prosperity of the Vajans be expected, and not their downfall. So long, Ananda, as the Vajans assemble in harmony and disperse in harmony so long as they do their business in harmony. So long as they do not introduce any revolutionary ordinance, or break up any established ordinance. But abide by the old-time Vajan law, as ordained. So long as they honor, reverence, esteem and worship the elders among the Vajans and deem them worthy of listening to, so long as the women and maidens of the families dwell without being forced or abducted, so long as they honor, revere, esteem and worship the Vajan shrines, both the inner and the outer, so long as they allow not the customary offerings, given and performed, to be neglected. So long as the customary watch and ward over the Arahas that are among them is well kept. So that they may have free access to the realm and having entered may dwell pleasantly therein. Just so long as they observe these principles, Ananda, may the prosperity of the Vajans be expected. And not their decay. Revolutionary as were the teachings of the Buddha in the sense of substituting ethical rules. And setting up principles of conduct in place of the formalized ritualism of his Brahmic contemporaries. A feature which emerges clearly and consistently throughout his discourses, it is evident that in temporal matters he advocated the preservation of all customs, which time had proved to be beneficial, 
and condemned only those which were socially retrogressive. As for instance caste. Or spiritually obscurantist, as in the priestly emphasis on ceremonial sacrifice and extreme asceticism. Which in Buddhism is stigmatized as S superscript 2 labadapar plus or minus M plus or minus SA or superstition. In the matter of caste, the Buddha, as we have already seen, acknowledged distinctions as being inseparable from the working out of Kama. What he expressly denied was the Brahmanic teaching that caste was of divine origin, and the animistic concept that the four major castes of Indian society took their origin from different parts of the body of Brahma. This is succinctly set forth in those verses of the Dhammapada which proclaim that a Brahmin, in the Buddhist sense, a holy man, is a Brahmin not by birth but by purity of thought, word, and deed. Neither by matted hair nor by birth does one become a Brahmin. But in whom there exists both truth and Dhamma, he is the pure one, and he is the Brahmin. Dhammapada 393 It is worthy of note that in dealing with the question from the purely social angle, the Buddha placed the Kadiya caste, nobility, highest in rank. Distinctions obtain on the worldly level, but for those who have renounced the world there are no distinctions, the worth of the holy man is measured by his virtue alone. This principle has its broader application in the sphere of present-day racial and nationalistic problems. In Buddhism there is no basis for racial superiority, cults, or antagonisms. Each man has his own individual worth irrespective of his racial or cultural background. The question of human rights is inextricably bound up with that of individual responsibilities. In the present preoccupation with the rights of communities and individuals there is a tendency to overlook the fact that the concept of rights implies also the ideas of obligations and duties. At about the same time that the Buddha was preaching in India, Confucius in China was proclaiming this truth in his own doctrine of rationalistic humanism. While Confucius outlined his concept of the ideal ruler, benign, just and ever solicitous for the welfare of his people, the Buddha was turning the thoughts of his disciples away from the old idea that the duties enjoined by religion were ritualistic performances. To the higher ideal of a layman's duty, his responsibility to others. In the Sagalaveda Sutta he preaches to a young Brahmin who was following his father's behest to worship the six directions. North, South, east, west, the zenith and the nadir, with clothes and hair wet and clasped hands uplifted. But in the religion of an Arya, young householder, it is not thus that the six directions should be worshipped. Thus the Buddha began his instruction, and went on to explain that the worshipping of the six quarters is to be understood in an ethical sense. First comes a general description under numerical heads, of things to be avoided by a householder as leading to ruin and disrepute and virtues to be cultivated as being conducive to happiness and prosperity. The sermon then continues and how, young householder, does the Aryan disciple honor and protect the six directions? The following should be looked upon as the six directions, parents as the east, teachers as the south, wife and children as the west, friends and companions as the north, servants and work people as the nadir religious teachers and holy men as the zenith. This is followed by a detailed explanation of a man's duty towards each of these classes of people as they stand in relation to himself. The whole forming a discourse on social ethics that is unrivaled for its breadth and nobility of conception. As well as for its universal applicability. Two examples will suffice to show how the idea of reciprocity in duties is emphasized. In five ways should a clansman minister to his friends and associates as the northern direction. By generosity, courtesy, and benevolence, by treating them as he treats himself. And by being true to his word. In these five ways thus ministered to as the northern direction. His friends and associates love him, they shield him when he is off his guard. And on such occasions protect his property, they become a refuge in danger. They do not forsake him in his troubles, and they show consideration for his family. Thus is the northern direction by him protected and made safe and secure. In five ways does an Aryan master minister to his servants and employees as the nadir by assigning them work according to their strength. By supplying them food and wages, by tending them in sickness. By sharing with them unusual delicacies and by granting them proper recreation. 
In these ways ministered to by their master, servants and employees love their master in five ways. They rise before him, they lie down to rest after him, they are content with what is given to them. They do their work well, and they spread abroad his praise and good fame. Thus is the nadir by him protected and made safe and secure. The Buddha's treatment of the theme in this sutta is typical of the way in which he was accustomed to take some already existing religious belief and give it a higher spiritual or ethical meaning. He conveyed his own higher truth through the medium of a current tradition. It must be remembered that the Buddha did not teach a new law, he preached the Sanantana Dhamma, the ancient truth of the Buddhas before him. Although their teaching had passed out of men's memories, or had survived only in the form of outward observances whose inner significance had been lost, it still remained. And remains, the universal unchanging Dhamma, the underlying principle of cause and effect that governs phenomenal existence. Of the Buddha it can truly be said that he came, not to destroy the law but to fulfill it, to restate it in its highest spiritual meaning. We stand now at a turning point in history. The choice is ours whether we shall take the road that leads to further progress or that which will carry us to destruction. Mankind has had enough experience at least to show that scientific knowledge and mastery of the material universe is not the same thing as progress in civilization. Our eyes must be turned in a new direction if we are to find a way out of the impasse. But, just as we are bounded by the curved space-time of physics, so we are encircled by the sphere of related concepts. That which is newest is most immeasurably old, the eternal Dhamma, the ageless truth beyond our small world of material concerns. It is to that we must return, in all humility and hope, for the old diseases we must seek the old remedies. But in the sphere of truth there is nothing old and nothing new. The sun that sinks this evening in the west will rise again tomorrow in the east.